And today we are so excited because we have Teresa Romero with us. She's going to be sharing some incredible haircutting. Teresa has a huge, huge history to pull from because she was a uh, um, Redken artist. She was the Sassoon Academy director. Um, she was director of education for Avenue 5 Institute. She is Naha winner. She is an internationally published in, uh, hair and makeup artist. This woman has an incredible wealth of knowledge and education, and we are so happy to have her here today. Please join us in welcoming Sambi Ambassador Teresa Romero. Good morning, Hi, Teresa. Good morning. Thank you, Andrew. I'm so happy to be here with you guys. Um, I can't wait to get started. So, you know, I'd like to just go ahead and dive right in. What do you think, Andrew? Go for it, my friend. It's all you. Go for it. Okay. So today's um, focus is really about disconnection and how you can make it work to be your friend and to, to achieve different results with it. Um, more often than not, a lot of the cuts that I do in the salon have some sort of disconnection to them, but it's done with a purpose. Um, disconnection doesn't always have to be just for a visual effect. Um, disconnection can solve a problem. Uh, it, it obviously can create a visual effect but today we're, I'm going to use disconnection in a means to create those floaty little bits of texture that we're seeing in the press today, where it's just these soft little bits that kind of just float over the hair as, <laughs> as this one's floating over my blonde mannequin. And it's like, well, how do I, how do I make that happen? She's going to come back later. We're going to talk more about her, but let's see how we made that happen. Okay. So to get started, I pre-cut half of this mannequin. And what I really like about this particular shape is that the floating movement is happening over a solid foundation. So a solid line. All of this under here is just one length. And I'm just gonna come here on this side. I just wanted you guys to be able to see just how long this mannequin was to begin with. So as you can tell, it was pretty long. And where we're going is just that nice short solid blunt line again creating that structure to where I can have something floating on top of the structure let's go ahead and get that top section out of the way just a nice easy cut guys do make sure that when you're working with your clients or in this case a mannequin that the chin is parallel to the floor you don't want the chin to be off to an angle one side or the other in this case, because then your line will be crooked as well. I'm gonna step off screen for just a second, pull that hair straight down. I will turn this so that you can see in a moment. I'm gonna spin her so that you guys can see what I'm doing on this side. Again, I'm gonna stand off to the side so that you guys can see more easily but my comb is going to mimic the shape of my end result. So I'm gonna keep my comb very square and then I'm gonna come across and remove that hair. I am using the Sandia Classic Shears that just came out. I'm absolutely in love with them. They're super easy to manipulate within my hands. I'm gonna bend down, get that look, hold that shape. Notice how the shears are parallel to the line that I'm cutting. Check for movement. And because there was really no elevation to that, I'm not gonna have any sort of a graduated sort of feel here. Literally, this is just straight down, turn the corner and a nice square shape, square line as well. Now you can choose creatively how you wish this first step to be. If you wish this to be more angular, that's totally up to you guys in the client consultation. If you wish this to be more rounded, you could do that as well. I just believe square shapes are really in right now. They're going to stay in. They're not going to go away. These square lines are going to be with us for a while. I'm going to step back for just a moment. You'll see me off. I'm going to step off screen because I like to step in front of my mannequin to see how they look. And I do the same thing in the salon with my client. Step back and take a look at your work. And as you'll notice on this left side, I need to take just a tiny bit more. Let's go ahead and get that taken care of. I'm much happier now. All right, guys. So let's keep going from here. All right, just check in for response. Now I've pre-sectioned this top out for you. So let's go ahead and take these clips down so you can see what that looks like. Okay. 
All right, taking, taking all of these sections down. So what I'm working with is from the parietal ridge area up. So I'm working from this area around the head up. Then from the highest point of elevation on top of the head, let's take a look at the profile at that. Sorry about that, guys. Anakin got a little stuck. So again, from the highest point of elevation, I'm making a series of triangles. As you can see, this first one starts here, moves forward, and then there's a series of triangles that work around. So let's clean that up so you can see that really good. Get your cameras ready in case you like to get a screenshot or get that screenshot ready on your PC if you're at home on a computer. I would do the same thing in the salon. Is separate that hair, give it a nice little twist, and work all the way around. Now, some of the questions I would have, I know if I was you guys out there, it'd be like, well, Teresa, what if what if my client's hair is not real long on top? Can I still take this approach? Absolutely. It's just going to create a different texture sitting on a solid line. So now let's take a nicer look at that. Okay, here we go, in case you need a screenshot, guys. There we go, that's a good one. So again, that's the highest point of elevation, the largest triangle coming out over the top of the forehead, creating that fringe area. Then triangles around the side. And then eventually, let me hold this in place for you. the two large triangles in the back, okay? How's that going, Andrew? Is everyone getting that? Looking good so far. Yes, that's awesome. We can see it really well. Okay, great. And the reason this is so important, Andrew, and, and everyone out there is this sectioning is what's setting you up for success. If your sectioning is too irregular or unplanned, you're going to get um, happy unplanned hair results <laughs> that maybe won't be so happy. Or it could be a great discovery. But nonetheless, if you plan for success, you're going to achieve success. So that's why I am pre-sectioning here. Now that first section is a lot of hair to take care of at one time. So I'm going to actually take that in two sections. I'm not changing my structure or my triangle. All I'm changing is the amount of hair that I'm holding. So I'm just gonna split that right down the middle. Now I'm gonna turn it to the profile because here's the part that is going to be different for a lot of you. Let's make sure that's right. With each section, I'm gonna be changing my hand position. This very front section is going to go from short to long the next triangle is going to be short in the back to a long front. This section here will be short at the bottom, longer top. And now let's watch what that looks like. So again, I'm at that center triangle. And I'm going to show from the profile first, and then we'll show from the front. This again is that very large triangle over the forehead. And here we go. I'm gonna go from short to long. So short right over the forehead, long coming out from the highest point of elevation. Now I don't wanna go cutting this too short, so I'm actually going to leave the hair slightly longer. And I know a lot of times we'd be saying, well, what's your, what's your starting point? How did you decide where you want to start, Teresa? In her case, I used the tip of the nose as the length that I would like to have in the front because I'd like to have some room to be able to texturize these pieces in here, okay? So here's our first section, let's turn her. Making sure everyone can see that okay. That looks nice. Still within that first big triangle, I'm just gonna over direct this to the center I'm going to pick up the hair that I just cut, bring this hair straight out. Now you can see the angle from here using the tip of the nose as my guide. 
And let's remove these this hair. In this case, I am using the swivel handle shear because it's allowing my hand position to move to where I need to be very comfortably. Okay, now I'm gonna leave that whole section of hair there. This, again, is a cut within itself. So I don't wanna change any of that right now. That's the area that's gonna live right over the fringe. Teresa, what um, what kind of hair textures do you, would you recommend that this uh, type of haircut be used on? So I love that question, and I was hoping someone would ask that question. <laughs> so what type of hair textures? Uh, really any hair texture, but keep in mind, now, if you're working with finer hair, such as hair like my own, structure, I love a disconnected feel, personally, myself. Um, but I have to have structure to that. If you go in and you point cut or you texturize heavily into finer hair like my own, um, it just makes the shape collapse too much sometimes. However, you can create that floaty feel by this one of these techniques that I'm doing here because there's structure within each section, okay? Now, moving on to more medium or coarser texture hair, could I do the same thing? Absolutely. Maybe I'll need to use just a little bit more of uh, my texturizing shears along with that, or perhaps even a razor, because when we increase the density and increase the texture, sometimes you need to break it up a little bit more. Keep in mind, if I did this on curly hair, which I have, it's an amazing result. Uh, just imagine this curly texture with an expansive feel of disconnection out over the top. And I actually have, excuse me just a second, I'm gonna walk off screen, a young lady that I can show you where this was done on curly hair. Here we go. This was done on curly hair, but the difference is instead of the circle sectioning up here with the triangles being right on top, I did it here on the side. So right in, oops, sorry, wrong side, Teresa, right in here. There we go. See if I can get enough light on that. So those alternating triangles happened on this side. So from the front view, we have, I apologize, let me get out of the way so you can see better, these floating pieces of texture that just come out as, hold on, there they go, and there she is. <laughs> those floating bits of texture on the hair. So uh, Andrew, I hope that helps answer the question, question being what sort of texture would I use this on? Well, all types of texture. You just have to think about what's the personality of the texture. Fine hair collapses. Let's sum it up. Fine hair collapses. So we want to do something that creates structure to support it. Curly hair on the opposite end can be very expansive. So we want to do something that if we do this technique, it's going to expand it even further. So again, let's keep going, guys. We're in that center triangle, everything tip of the nose, straight out from the head and was removed. Now let's go on to our next triangle, right here. And again, everything's stopping right around the parietal ridge because that's where the natural fall happens and the hair begins to fall naturally forward. So remember how I had said this, tri this triangle was going to alternate differently? I don't wanna come through here and cut from short to long in the front I actually want to cut short to long from the highest point of elevation. So this is my highest point of elevation. I'm bringing the triangle section up. And remember, I have another one here. So I'm going to show you from a different view when we get to that side. I will stand out of your way here in just a moment. Bringing that section up. So how short do you want to make this piece back here, Teresa? Well, just for consistency, see, I'm thinking of where the hair is going to fall. Right now, the hair is falling right around the nose. So if I want this hair to fall right around where that clip is, I need to cut to about right there. Okay. So again, this is, this is planned out. Can you get creative and do all kinds of stuff? Absolutely. But, but first, I would suggest trying this with a little bit more structure. Learn what this technique will do. I'm gonna adjust that screen just a little so you can see where I'm going here. And Teresa, how do you know how much length you wanna leave in the front? Well, you can see the length 
down here, the end length. So what I want to do is when this falls, I want to make sure that it falls below that perimeter length. Because if I cut this as short as here, then all of a sudden I've just created a bob without the floating texture. Does that make sense? How does that sound, Andrew? Andrew, would we like to say that again? So what I'm getting from you is it actually, it's kind of overcut or no, I guess it is still undercut because the pieces on top are actually longer than your perimeter. Yeah, exactly right. It's like, it is exactly like an undercut from the perimeter down in the shape of a nice solid, in this case, square looking bob. Cool. That's really, that's really neat. So let's take another look. So this is the section that I just cut guys. You see how I left me some, actually left it, some extra hair to play with there. Okay. So let's take a look on this other side. Again, this is the matching triangle. We got our center large one. Now I'm right over the corners of the head or that offset area. This is the area where the hair begins to recede back a little bit. Excuse me, it's right in here. And what do we know about hair that recedes a little bit? Allow extra space for that. Be extra generous with the hair that you leave. I can always go back and remove more hair. What I can't do is put it back on as easily. We can put it back on, it's just not as easy. Okay, so this is what I wanted to show you. What I'm doing is I'm working right over the section. Can you see how so I'm not over directing one side or the other. I am pulling this hair right over the top of itself, right there. So there's really not much over direction happening within this section. Well, why is that, Teresa? Why am I not over directing very much? Because I want this triangle of hair to live right here, right where it naturally falls. I want this triangle section of hair to live right here where it naturally falls. So let's take another look at that. Well, I have my guide. It's the little point of the triangle on the other side. I am going to actually move my screen back just a little because I'd like for you guys to see this movement. Again, I'm elevating the hair right above itself. There's my starting point. Let's flip this hair out of the way so you guys can see better. And I'm going to be generous as I walk this section out. Again, I'm over the hairline where it begins to recede. So I don't want to take too much of hair away and have a hole. So I'm going to leave a little extra again so that you guys can see that little bit of extra hair. All right. So now this little piece of hair going back into its little twist. And this little piece of hair that we've already cut is going back into its twist. Now in the salon, this can go really quickly, guys. I'm actually going slower with it because I really want to break down the technique. Um, I would describe this to my clients as like a pinwheel technique. They like that term. They're like, ooh, a pinwheel technique. What, you know, what can I do with that? And it's just, again, a pinwheel being that there's a center point with a series of triangles coming off of it. So now we're on the sides. We're literally at the highest point of elevation again. I'm going to work with this section of hair. This is a section of hair that falls right over the sides, right over the top of the ear. So if this was short to long, short in the front, long in the top, and this was short on top and long in the perimeter, I bet you guys can guess where this one's going. Just like this triangle. So I'm, again, elevating this entire section. This is where you can really appreciate the disconnection because again, my, want my still goal area to be right in here where I begin that cut, which is going to be right there. Again, elevating this section up and, and you know, I'm working straight up guys. You don't have to over direct or push to the other side. But look what happens now. Now I have this section of hair where the perimeter is still solid. The interior is disconnected. And as these pieces of hair fall, it pushes the longer hair that's coming from the top out. 
because we, as we know, long hair pushes, excuse me, short hair pushes long hair. I almost said that opposite. Short hair pushes long hair. Well, we think about that happening horizontally, but have you thought about that happening vertically on the side? Because that's what we just created. Let's take a look at this other side now. Let's do the same thing. Again, I'm working with, and this hair is beginning to dry and that's okay. That's what I wanna see. I wanna see some natural air drying happening here so that I can see how this hair wants to live and play. Can you see the section? We're dealing with this section right here that lives right over the top of the ear. Can you tilt the uh, camera back up a little bit? We're, we're kind of losing where you're cutting. Right here? Yeah, awesome, thank you. Awesome. And um, just yeah. as you're talking too, Rosie actually had another great question. Um, how would you adapt this to different lengths of hair? Like if you wanted to cut this on longer hair, or if you wanted to cut it into something shorter, how would you adjust what you're doing? Awesome, well, let me address two things with that. So just so we're all back on the same page, um, sorry about that angle guys, I hope this is better. Again, we're dealing with that section that lives right over the top of the ear. This is hair that's gonna fall forward or excuse me, fall vertically right over the top of the ear. And to a great question, Rosie, thank you for asking that. So how would I decide my different lengths of hair? Obviously you can be really creative. However, if I'm dealing with hair that's really long, let me step back so you can see, if I'm dealing with hair that's really long, then I'm gonna consider the hair density. If the hair's thinner, then I'm going to have to be more conservative with this approach perhaps, because I don't want to take away the thickness of the length. Uh, unless, that, of course, that's what you want. If you want the ends to look shattered, then that's one way of creating that to happen. I find that this works best on hair that's like collarbone length or higher. And the reason is, is we're trying to create that floaty feel, hair that just floats off of the head form. So if it gets too long down through here, let's say, you lose that ability to float as well with this particular technique. I would actually choose a different technique if I was dealing with really long hair. The collarbone up, anything that's a solid line, triangular or a round, excuse me, round sort of line, this works very well sitting right over the top of it. Does that help? Does that help answer the question, Andrew, for Rosie? Yeah, I think that's great. Thank you. All right. So again, thank you so much, Andrew. We, and now we're going to go, you can see the nose really well. I want my, I want the hair shortest piece to start in here somewhere testing where that's going to be right in there. And can everyone see, I'll bring this back just so everyone can really see this. Notice as I move to the top, let's move this back. This is the narrowest part of the triangle at the very top. Now that when this falls over, See how it falls past the solid bob shape that I have underneath. All right, let's bring this little guy back around, give him a little twist. So now we have two really large sections in the back. So what do we wanna do with these two triangles? Well, does anyone out there have any requests with what they would like to see happen in these two triangles? Andrews, we have any requests, any opinions? Because there's lots of directions I can bring this. Nothing's popping up yet, so I, I think you can um, you so can, we can continue go to it. guide us where you want <laughs> us to go. Yeah. All right. So let's stick to the plan of what you actually saw whenever we were doing um, the average uh, the uh, social media tile for this, which is actually this particular girl right here. So let's finish out how we did this area on her. Again, in the front, short around the nose, longer at the top of the section here. Next triangle. This section was actually longest at the highest point of elevation, shortest on the side. So if we stick to that plan, what would be our next one? So short to long, long to short, short to long, long to short. Now in this case, I do want to have a little bit of creative fun. So I'm going to turn her to the side so that you guys can see.
and I'm going to work in this case, because sometimes I like to see a little bit of height and movement in the crown area of especially a bob sort of haircut. So I'm actually going to keep this shorter at the highest point of the elevation in both of these sections and leave the length floating out over the perimeter. So if you kind of think about this, this is kind of a bob with a shag sort of mixture on top. This hybrid cutting of different techniques that we're seeing, guys, they're going to continue to happen. They're not going to go away. I think clients are looking for a lot of creativity in their cut, not just problem solving. Again, short at the highest point, long over the perimeter. I'm going to stand on this side so that we can get another angle at that look. And this back two triangles, I'm actually combining into one large triangle. And the reason for that, again, is to have a little bit of height coming from that highest point of elevation, making sure everybody can see. Let's turn this slightly. Let's take her a little bit further. There we go. Teresa, would you change the size of the triangles based on the, the density of hair? Like if they had kind of thinner hair, would you change the size of the triangles or fewer or um, more triangles? Absolutely. That's a very good question. So how would I adjust the size of the triangles based upon the density of the hair? Did I understand that correct? That's correct. Thank you. So again, finer hair sometimes is less dense hair, meaning not as thick. So I don't want to take two smaller triangles with hair with less density because what's going to happen is, unfortunately, the hair may just collapse on itself or look too blended. You're going to lose some of that floating disconnection feel. So in general, if the hair density is lower, I would most likely keep my triangles a little bit larger so that we can get more structure to that cut. Not a have to, but that's just a general place to start. Um, I know a lot of times when we learn a new technique as a hairdresser, the first thing we want to do is go, oh, what if I do this? And what if I do this? And what if I do this? <laughs> Very guilty of that myself. However, I would suggest trying it as we've done it today first on all densities of hair and different textures of hair just to get a feel for what it's going to create. To further answer that question though, Andrew it, and everyone out there, if I was dealing with hair that's thicker and has more density, I could take smaller triangles and it's just gonna create more of a mishmash vertically through the hair of movement. So now when I shake this hair out, I'm gonna take her off the stand so you guys can see we have an overhang of hair and I'm gonna move this out of the way for just a moment. So obviously we have an overhang of hair that we need to work with. Now, I'm not saying leave all that much hair there. I'm just saying I'm leaving options. I wanna leave myself options to play with so that as once I have this hair dry, I can decide how much of that overhang I wanna keep or not keep. All right, so let's get the dryer going guys. So it won't take long. I do suggest that you do a little bit of a power dry because the rest of this really needs to happen on hair that's been dried. Let's tighten that back up. We only do that in the salon, right? That would be pretty cool. <laughs> okay, here we go. Okay, guys. So as we go through here, I'm going to dry in the general direction that I want the hair to fall in. You don't have to overwork it. I'm literally just wanting it to be smoother. I want to get the dampness out. And I'm looking for styling opportunities. I do this a lot with my clients as well. So this is what I mean by styling opportunity. You see here on this side, right in here, beginning to love how that texture really curls up. So if this was someone with wavier hair, I may would play that texture up for them. And this would be a great time to talk to them about what sort of curl or wave products you would want to put in the hair. In this case, though, I want to go for a straighter feel. 
And I love to use my hands. I love my brushes, but I also like to use my hands in this case because I'm still constructing the haircut. I'm going to spin around so you can see how this is working. But as you can see, as it dries, I'm looking for the expansion that it's creating down here. Is that overhang or a veil of hair? And with your permission, guys, I would like to just turn this on high and let's get this other side really dry right quick. It's just a quick power dry. Go back. Oh, sorry guys, using my hands going back and forth to encourage the hip root movement to go to either side. Continuing to look at the roots, again making sure that I'm getting nice movement at the roots. Working my way around. satisfied with that so let's go into what we're going to use next guys which is obviously going to be our Sambia iron and this is the one and a half inch marcel iron we already got it warmed up so we can get going now we're not done with the cut we still have some dry cutting to do one thing about dry cutting is you tend to wear the hair yourself <laughs> Teresa, I love this question from Colleen because, you know, especially if you had a client in your chair that hadn't had this kind of haircut before, yes. you know, like this phase, they might be kind of like, oh my gosh, Teresa, like what's going on here? So, what did you do to me? <laughs> yeah. So how do you set this up with your clients so that they understand that like there's kind of a process here and that, that it's not just like, you know, they're not instantly going to see there's kind of like a process to the end result. Awesome. That is such a great question. And thank you for bringing that question up because I think it's very important. I have this conversation with my client. So as I go through here, let me curl this and then let me move this so you guys can see me better. So as I go through this, I actually have that conversation with my client. I set them up for success and myself by having that during the consultation. And I just let them know. Okay, so we're talking about this type of cut, guys. We want that floating sort of texture to happen out over the top of the head. For me to create that, what I'm going to have to do is actually cut this top section of the hair slightly different than the bottom section of the hair. And then I remind them as we're going through the process, what we're doing. In essence, I'm pretty much teaching them the haircut. Um, I want them to know the verbiage, the what to expect. So for instance, before I blow dried this particular client's hair, I would let her know, you know as we're blow drying this, you're going to notice that your ends are not going to look groomed. They're not going to look manicured. They're going to look like they're just kind of sticking out. <laughs> and the reason it is is because we're just not done with the cut yet. So we're going to have to get your hair more styled, and then we'll finish grooming the cut, which usually leads to the question from a client of what's that going to be like when I do this at home? Well, once they go through this, they're going to see that this is setting them up for success at home. So that they don't have to work near as hard to create those end results of a floating sort of texture. Because right now, obviously, guys, that is just too much hair to leave on the ends for a floating texture. But before I can finish it out and personalize it, and use words like personalization, this cut has been personalized to meet the needs of your hair or your lifestyle. I'm designing this around the way you like to wear your hair. I'm designing this look around your personality so we can maximize the look for you. So anything to make it personal to them, because it is. This is a very personal approach. These are things that a lot of times, to be really honest with you guys, you see this behind the stage in hair shows. When I would do shows, we would do a lot of this stuff. And then we would bring it out and they, uh, on stage and people would be like, Oh my gosh, how did they do that? What did they do? You know, was that an extension? 
And I really feel like these are things that, you know, this isn't just for a stage room. These are things we should show you guys, the professional, so that you can create this as well. Um, my personal philosophy is everyone should look like they just walked off stage. You know, <laughs> even if they air dry their hair, I want them to look like they just walked off stage and they had this amazing look. All right, let's keep going. Those were excellent questions, by the way. Thank you. Andrew, do we have any more questions right now? I know I'd be saying, well, Teresa, what do the ends look like at the, right now? And I'm about to show you guys. There you go. Um, Rosie had asked if you had uh, prepped the mannequin with any product before you blow dried. Yes, great question. Thank you, Rosie. So as far as product goes, it, you know, use your favorite product. In this case, I use minimal product. I use just a nice moisturizing leave-in conditioner. I just want to see what the hair is going to do in its natural form. Again, this is a client scenario where they're possibly not going to want to do a whole lot to their hair. They're not looking to spend hours on their hair. They're literally looking to be able to air dry and then just do the big iron on these few little pieces like I'm doing here. I mean, imagine how much time you're saving for someone if, if we can tell them, look, just air dry your hair. When you wake up in the morning, all you have to do is those last few little pieces with the iron or just put a little bit of styling cream into it. And I know personally, that's very exciting to me because sometimes, honestly, we just don't have a lot of time in the mornings. And it's nice to know that we can do something very quickly. Okay, I'm going to let those little pieces rest for just a moment. And we're going to go into some texturizing. All right. So right in through here, what I'm looking to do is I'm going to use my 14 point shear. And I want to come in and just take that very center bit. I want to rotate her to the side. I want to mimic the same cutting position that I was in. Actually, I think it's better if I leave my shirt there with that blonde hair. And then I'm going to do a one, two, three movement. So about halfway from the head form out to the end. So I'm going to go about halfway. I'm going to go one full close. And then I'm going to move out slightly, one full close, move out slightly again, and one full close on those ends. So let's talk about that again. I love how this hair, I don't want to go into the top, this area too much on top. Let's look from the pro the down position here from the top view. I don't want to dig into the density of the hair here because I like how this hair is moving forward. If I dig into this area too closely or too much, what's going to happen is it's going to create movement where I want the hair to actually lay a little flatter to the head. Where I want the movement to happen is halfway down the strand through the ends. That's why we chose and let's straighten her back up because she's a talker. She's moving her head a lot today. <laughs> let's go right back to the middle again. Let's look at that one more time. And I want to bring this closer for you guys so you can see it. So bear with me for just a moment. There we go. Andrew, is that closer so that everyone can see better? Yeah, we've got a great view there. Thank you. Okay, Because I just want to make sure in case you guys want to take pictures of this, this is your opportunity. So we're going to do it again. So let me set the shears down. Let's walk through this because there's a reason behind everything that we do. Um, as an artist, sometimes we see things that just happen because a lot of us are, are intuitive hair cutters and we're just like, I know when I do this, it works. But there's actually a science behind and a reason why it works. So I think it's really important that we understand the reasoning here so that we can recreate this look. Again, the top part coming from the highest point of the elevation out. I'm going to leave thicker. I don't want to dig into this area. I'm going to go about halfway down the strand, right where my comb is. We're going to close the shear, add a little further, cut again, and then once more on the ends. Let's take a look. I'm going to place the comb over here so that you guys can see better. And one, close, slide down, close, slide down, close. 
I picked those spots deliberately, and here's why. Make sure everyone can see this well. This was the first close of this year. Notice where that hits right at the hairline. So when this falls, it begins to open up. And guess what it does to the hair? It begins to push, push this hair open and creates a version of that curtain fringe that we're looking for. Have you ever done a curtain fringe before? And you're like, oh my gosh, half of this one half did great. And the other half, you're like, what happened? <laughs> well, that has to do with ergonomics, but it also... And because on one side, if you're a right-handed hair cutter, it's very comfortable for me to get in here and do my three cuts. But it might not be as comfortable on the left side. But if you know exactly where you want to go, then you can repeat that process with each section. And again, just to recap, I'm still just in that first main triangle. I haven't moved past that main triangle that's sitting over her fringe. Okay, let's take a look at that. I just love those shears. I mean, they just do so much beautiful work for us. I was gonna ask too, then I'm glad you just said that because I was gonna ask, you know, what made you choose that specific, the, the 14 tooth with the bigger teeth, what made you choose that over maybe something like the invisible end that's got the finer teeth and yeah. softer? So the nice thing about these guys, let me get the hair out of them so it looks nicer for you. Um, when I use these, here we go, you can see the notches that are in here. I actually want to remove a whole little section of hair. I'm not trying to just blend it. I actually want to have a little, like a mini haircut within the haircut, if you will. So when you cut that hair, let me see if I have someone I can show you with. Let's move this over. So if I was to place this shear in here, when I cut, I'm actually cutting those little sections and I can pull those sections out and you can see the hair that I'm removing. And in this case, it let started right here. And I'm strategically placing that to create a particular result. In the case of this fringe, I want the fringe to be able to open up like a curtain fringe but still have airiness and softness. And the, all the first little shorty, shortest pieces are hitting here, then here, and then right on the edges. From there, you can visually come in and start to personalize this cut even further, if you would like. Now, I will say this is where your client starts to feel really excited. Now, chances are, if you do this type of cuts on your client, they are already coming to you because you do these type of cuts. If this is someone who's new to, for you, or even someone, and I find that new clients, are they're already wide open to this because they're like, hey, I came to you. I, I'm, I heard what you do. I, I love your work. And I feel like sometimes we get more creative freedom with those newer clients. It's our established clients that are used to us being a certain way, and then we throw them this curveball. Hey, I learned this new technique. I can't wait to share this with you. And they're like, ah, oh, hold on there, Teresa. <laughs> Give me a little bit more information about that new technique. So do take them through it. And regardless if it's a new client or an old client, explain to them what you're doing. So again, I'm going to come right into this middle section. I would like to bring that up a little bit shorter. I'm going to go right to that bridge of the nose or slightly above it. Placing the shear behind it and making sure everyone can see. I'm going to close, 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 close and create just a soft little short fringe, which nice. even further opens that up for her. Um, Kelly's asking, how do you decide what side will be cut with the still blade versus the notch? So yeah, how do where do you place the solid blade versus the notch side of the blade? Great question, Kelly, thank you. <laughs> so let's take a look at that. I can actually show it on this section again. So if I was to pull this section out, I wanna put my, my still blade underneath and when I cut that because that way it doesn't grab on the hair let me open that up all the way so you can see see it doesn't catch on the hair if I come in this way it's going to push the hair because these teeth are going to grab the hair that's its job right so I want to be able to make it the most comfortable that I can for my client I could actually come in through here open my shear 
pick up the section. I don't even have to hold the hair. And I could remove what I want from them. Does that make sense? I hope that answers your question, Kelly. And then let's yeah, do that. that's great. And also, you know, one way that uh, Jesse Linares explained it is that it also is um, those teeth. If the teeth are facing up after you close this year, the hair that's left, like when you're trying to do a technique like you're doing, Teresa, when the, the hair that's left is kind of left sitting inside the teeth. So in, in order to recut it, you have to fully remove the shear and then put exactly. it back in, fully remove the shear, put it back in. So placing that solid blade on bottom, when you lift yeah, the teeth I can back go up, in. you yeah. can keep going, coming back down to it. So all day long, that solid blade could go in and I could cut anywhere on the head that I wanted. And I, and I love that point. Thank you for sharing that, Andrew, because just to demo what Andrew's talking about, see if I go in with the teeth, how I'm pushing the hair, and then I got to take the shear completely out. Whereas here I can cut, I can cut, I can cut, which is one of the ways I like to finish this look. So let me bring this down because I would like for you to be able to see. I'm not going to start way up here because I'm not trying to sh cut shorter hair within it. I'm actually going to start more here. Because I want to begin softening those pieces. Now, usually you would see someone hold this, which is absolutely fine. And if you're more comfortable holding the hair, please do so. For instance, as coming through here. And it's okay if you pick up some of the hair from the bob that we cut underneath, that solid form. Now notice her head's kind of tilted back just slightly. I'll do that with my client as well. And the reason I do that is I don't want that hair because it could look a little uncomfortable to them to have it fall just like right here on their shoulders. So I'll actually tilt their head back just slightly. Nice little hot tip. And that way the hair goes back behind them rather than on top of them. Then when they put their head back upright, they can begin to see those floaty bits happening right here. And I teach my clients how to do this. This is my little zhuzhin. <laughs> so when you come through here, actually show them. It's almost like you're using your thumb between your index and your middle finger and you're just doing little circular movement. And that is how you get these little floaty pieces of hair. I call that that runway hair that just kind of floats <laughs> as you go through. So would we like to see that again? You wanna see how that all worked on the other side? Let's take another look, guys. This is like putting the sprinkles on top of the cupcake for me. This is like, yes, it's all coming together. So let's bring her back slightly. Want to make sure you guys have a really good angle for this. And there we go. Um, Colleen's asking, how do you decide where your guide is at this point? So I, I don't imagine that you have necessarily an exact mm -hmm. guide, but you probably have kind of a visual of like where your entry points and exit points are. Can you exactly. kind of share how you're creating that? Absolutely. So at this point, we're getting very visual. And, and honestly, guys, when I first started, you know, really cutting hair like this, I, I would watch someone do this and I'd be like, oh my gosh, it just looks like they go in there and they just like cut away. And then I realized there was actually a plan to that. And it took practice. You know, I had to practice. I realized this kind of pushes boundaries. This this pushes the, the way we approach hairdressing sometimes taking these type of approaches. Um, so to answer your question even further, I don't want the hair to collapse up here. Like for instance, I'm enjoying the movement that I'm getting up here, okay? Where I want the airiness to happen is more towards the end. This is where we want it to float. I'm not trying to get these pieces to float. So I'm not gonna start my texturizing up here because what will happen is it will collapse or I'll get shorter pieces where I'm not actually looking for them. Because remember the alternating triangle sections created the different movement pieces already. So when I'm coming in with that texturizing shear, I'm looking about halfway down and then in. And that's a good general rule of thumb is if the hair length is here and your floaty bits are here, halfway down for your length, 
start your texturizing. In this case, my length is right in there, right there. So I'm starting about halfway down to create that float. That way I can take advantage of the curvature of the skull to create that nice curve and then these pieces will float out. I hope that helps. Does that give a, does that give a better visual? And I'm sorry guys, okay, awesome. Yeah, uh, and I think you're I, right. Sometimes it seems like it, it could potentially be random, but then you realize, no, there's actually a very um, focused and controlled approach, even if it looks more random. Yeah, even the most obscured modern painter, um, there is a plan behind what they do. It's, it, they just don't wake up and go, oh, okay, well, let's just throw some paint on the hair. Um, and the same thing with hair cutting. I just don't wake up and go, oh, well, let's just throw the shears in here. Um, now, just for fun, sometimes I'll do that, but certainly not on a client. So if I have a new pair of shears, for instance, when you get these guys, if you don't already have them, I highly suggest these 14 point shears. There is, it's endless what you can do with it. There's so much you can do with these guys. Um, when I first got them in, I literally just picked up a mannequin and just started cutting. I knew if I held at zero elevation, I'm creating weight. So what is it doing to the ends of the weight? If I begin to elevate the hair or do any sort of angle, then I know I'm creating some sort of graduation. So what is this doing at the different levels of graduation? And if I pull this up at a 90 or higher, then I know I'm going into layering. So what happens if I layer in a, in a layer elevation with these shears? So I just made discoveries so that I can set up plans. Because guess what? With texturizing, the rules don't change with your techniques. Elevation still di dictates the technique that you're using. That does not change just because we're only removing a few strands of hair. All right, guys, remember my little hot tip about tilting that head back slightly, and now you're gonna get, be able to see how this hair will fall behind your client. And again, kind of starting halfway down from where the length is. And I'd like to do patterns. Here's another hot tip, guys. If I'm going one, two, three, four on this side, then guess what I want to do on the other side? One, two, three, four. Okay. If I'm only taking three bites here and five bites on this side, am I going to get different results? Well, yes. Doesn't mean I can't go back in and take out more hair. Again, I'm just working with a pattern with a consistency so that I can create symmetry on both sides of the hair. Awesome. A little bit of fine tuning here. And again, this was is without the aid of additional styling product. I wanted you to really be able to see just what you can do just from technique alone. Look at the expansion that we're getting there. Even with this, what looks like a freehand technique, I'm still coming through and I'm counting to myself. It's three on one side, then it's three on the other side. Would I sometimes change that? Yes. And here's when I would change that. If I obviously have one side that's thinner than the other, then perhaps I would have to change that approach. But that's something you're going to discover during the consultation. Awesome. Let me take a look at her from the front. I do recommend that you stand in front of your client, guys. I want you to see what I'm doing. I want to stand right in front of my client. I want to get eye level. I want to see what they're seeing. Because remember, when you're working with a client, where are we all the time? We're up here, right? But they're sitting here. So we've got to get down to see what they see. Either have them stand up to where you can be more eye level, or we need to get down more eye level here so that we can see what's going on with that cut. I want to see what she's seeing. All right. One few, a few little final touches. We've almost got this completed, Andrew. Do we have any other questions as I put these last final bits on here? No, oh, fantastic job. You're getting tons of love in the chats. Um, people are loving the haircut and the creativity. Um, and 
you know, I just think it's so cool. You, you really, uh, I think expanded a lot of minds right now <laughs> because I think that there was, you know, that moment like, oh my gosh, look at all that, you know, fluffy, fuzzy hair. And, you know, and then it was like, oh my gosh, this is turning into something so great and so cool. And what I, I think is really brilliant watching someone like you, Teresa, is that we see in true artistry and action, um, you know, but there is still that discipline within your hands. Like, if, if we turned to the sound off and just watched you cut hair, we would just be like, wow, look at the artistry that's happening. But the way that you explain the why behind your approach, just um, it makes it something that we feel like we can actually do. So just fantastic education. Well, I gotta say, Andrew, true story. Um, the more artistry I saw from people and the influencers that I've learned from, the more I watched them, the more I was like, oh my gosh, they just like take the shears and they go and they cut the hair and it's so exciting. Yeah. And I can't go home, wait to go home and do this. You know, I always felt sorry for my Tuesday morning client because yeah, yeah <laughs> they were going to get some stuff. Yeah. And you know what? Sometimes that Tuesday morning client didn't come back. <laughs> Why? Why didn't they come back? Because I didn't understand the discipline of the mm -hmm. artistry. So the, the golden rule that I've learned is artistry is a discipline. And so wow. that I execute that effectively, I have to learn the discipline of that artistry. So when you, you see people who go through a mastery type program of any sort of art form, you see that they go through different stages. And, and why do you constantly re-blow dry the hair? Because each time you get better. Why do I reevaluate how I hold my round brush? Because you get better. Why do I practice cutting my, holding my shears? And if I haven't cut hair for a few days, why am I sitting on the sofa watching a movie doing this <laughs> so that I can stay in practice with my art form. So I want to practice the discipline so that I can execute my art form better. Does that well make said. sense? Yeah, absolutely. So this is how you create this sort of look. And I went a little shorter with their fringe because I just thought with the blonde hair, it just looked really cool. <laughs> And we, we consulted about it, her and I, and we agreed she needed <laughs> she needed a shorter fringe. Right. But I want to bring this in closer. I just want you to see that nice, there it is, solid perimeter line, which this is just blow dried straight underneath. I didn't go through and flat iron this or curling iron it. I just wanted it to be nice and straight. I like the con contradiction of that straight line with the soft floaty top. I believe that's where styles are. Definitely believe the shapes are going to be more square. Um, we've done round, we've done triangle. It's time for nice, some nice square sort of shapes. And I got to say, I have a lot of clients who wear this, guys, um, or variations of this technique. And earlier there was a question, Andrew, I, and I just thought of something I'd like to elaborate on. And that question was um, what about length of hair? I actually do this on hair that's waist length hair, but my short sections that are short back here, I can start quite short, but then I leave out the triangle that would be short down here going mm. to long. I only cut every other triangle short to long, short to long, short to long, and so on. So I hope that helps the person who had that question earlier. I just realized I did not address that. Well, it's perfect. You definitely yeah. answered all the questions. We had a great time learning from you, Teresa. So if you all want more education from Teresa, please go follow her at Teresa Romero. You get, you'll get you just really love the inspiration on Teresa's page. Just beautiful photography, beautiful hair. So please go give her a follow. Thank you so much, Teresa. Thank you. We'll see you again soon for more education. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Take care. Yeah.